welcome back to the National Pass. I realized yesterday I thought I had one more segment left in my show, so I said we'll be right back. Well, here we are. We're right back after just a 23-odd hour break. It was great to be here last night, by the way, for the live coverage of that debate. We started off a little dry, I think, but got quite interesting as time went on. We'll be talking about that more over the course of this program. Got an all-star cast here on the National Pulse today. Joining me in studio is Harlan Hill, a man with a lot to talk about <laughs> today. Um, after a very uh, interesting social media experience last night, Alexandra Priat, uh, public relations expert, will be joining us later on the program. And Thomas Farn, an author of The Russia Lie, will come back and update us on just how the Russia Lie continues to be exposed and fall apart as a total hoax. But let's get that Harlan Hill tweet up on the screen first, and we'll turn to Harlan and ask him what uh, what's been happening okay so harlan last night uh, 9:58 p.m yeah. kamala harris comes off as such an insufferable lying b-word sorry it's just true i think people would be grateful for the apology <laughs> there will not be an apology uh, sorry it's true <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fair, fair. Uh, There's an apology of sorts. But look, I mean, look, I've been in the same situation yeah. in the past. Yeah. I've, I've tweeted some things in the heat of a debate. Um, but I didn't trend on Twitter as a result of it, which you have done over the last... You're up to number five. Six yeah. hours. You're up to number five. Yeah. Um, not bad at all. <laughs> and um, you've been receiving some interesting voicemails. Can we play one of the voicemails that Harlan's received on the, on the hey, back of this? Harlan Hill can just eat a f***ing bullet, you stupid, racist, sexist, f***-sucking piece of Go f*** yourselves. Let's do that again. I didn't quite get that. <laughs> I want to just... Hey, Harlan Hill can just eat a f***ing bullet, you stupid, racist, sexist, f***-sucking piece of shit. Go f*** yourselves. So, uh, people want you to eat a bullet. <laughs> that was one of the more colorful ones, but I assure you, I have been inundated this morning with messages very similar to that. Threatening to kill me, threatening to kill my dog, telling me to kill myself, all this stuff, you know. And, you know, I'm Completely sure it's... normal reaction. Yeah, very, yeah, very normal, tame reaction. And I'm sure, you know, it's one of these people that has a uh, give peace a chance bumper sticker right. on their Prius. Right. You know what I mean? Um, coexist. Yeah, yeah, coexist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, but what 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 I've I've had to come to terms with this morning was there is such a double standard. We say it every day about every aspect of the media, but you can literally you you could throw a stone at the MSNBC bureau over on Capitol Hill, and you'll hit somebody that is called Trump Hitler, a Nazi, all kinds of nasty names on Twitter, and there's zero consequence for them. Right. And and there's this clear hyperbole. I still stand by what I said. I thought last night she was abrasive and nasty and rude to the, to the vice president, and she did lie repeatedly, repeatedly to the American people and to the moderator. And, and she's shown herself. I yes. mean, factually, yeah. to be insufferable, insufferable, in the sense that even the Democrat base didn't want to suffer her anymore. That's why they didn't pick her as their candidate. Yeah. But I suppose they were angry. People were angry at you about the B word, yeah. right? Which, in the grand scheme of things, is pretty tame. When you think about the types of things that the Lincoln Project guys tweet out about the president yeah. all the time, they're invited onto television freely. Um, they have adverts that yeah. run on Fox News, sure. the Lincoln Project, and Fox happily takes their money mm -hmm. to call the president all kinds of names. But Fox has said today, because you've, you've appeared on Fox a number of times, hundreds of times. Hundreds of times, yes. They've said they won't be inviting you back anytime soon. No, no, yeah. And I, I, you know, I was a little surprised to see the public statement come out from Fox. I mean, look, they've been really good to me for five years. I've been doing Fox for five years. I've been on Fox News, Fox Business, Fox Nation, all Fox Radio, hundreds and hundreds of times over the years. So I was a little surprised to see the statement come out. Uh, but th they've otherwise been good to me, and, and I, I don't want to hit them because, you know, at the end of the day, they are the biggest bulwark against uh, the leftist media that we have. Uh, the, the problem that I think on our side is that we need more organizations like this one uh, and the National Pulse to step up and to, to, to fill the vacuum yeah, as, as, as Fox I, News moves further to the middle. Yeah, I don't think Fox News is a bulwark against the left at all. I think they're an enablers of the left. Um, okay. Look at the people that they ban. Uh, Ann Coulter, Trish Regan, Bill O'Reilly, Steve Emerson, Sebastian Gorka, uh, Joe DeGeneva, Victoria Tensing. And yes, some of them they go back. Tucker. It, yeah, they still have Tucker oh, and fine. Sean. Yeah, we get, what are we getting? We got 
an, we get an hour of conservative programming, mm-hmm. maybe two, if you include yeah. uh, uh, Laura, yeah. right? Um, I'm not. I'm not interested in what Sean Hannity has to say anymore because Sean Hannity says the same thing every day. <laughs> anyway, the point being that Fox News isn't a bulwark against the left. Fox News has Donna Brazil, who, mm-hmm. who leaked the questions yeah. to Hillary Clinton. Fox News yeah. uh, uh, has never Trumpers on all the time. Yeah. Fox News uh, cut Newt Gingrich off for talking about George Soros. I mean, what is this bulwark against the, the left? Well, it has been traditionally the bulwark against the left. It's gone. And, Let um, it go. Let it go. The day that we the lose Drudge, Carlson, Drudge doesn't, then Drudge I'll be doesn't with you. want you anymore. Drudge right. doesn't like you anymore, mm-hmm. and Fox doesn't like you anymore. Yeah. Okay, yeah. embrace the suck. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it, it is it is disheartening. But listen, we all know people that have been banned. This is so it's something that they have to do to to, to because they they don't have the stomach, the appetite to stand up for people that have been there for years, um, producing content with them. And so, yeah, that is disheartening. That's disappointing. Um, but like I said, as long as Tucker and Ingram and a few other people are there, I'm, I'm not going to speak ill of Fox. Well, I'll do it for you. <laughs> um, the Fox News Network absolutely blows. It is an insufferable, lying. What was it? No, we won't use the word. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, oh, look, it's it's very clear. It's becoming increasingly clear to people every single day. Um, that it has just gone so far away from its uh, from its purpose, and you know it because of who the executives are and who they've given money to in this cycle. How many millions of dollars have been donated via the Fox News executives to Joe Biden? We have all of those data points at the tips of our fingers, and we still trust this network. They were very quick to throw Holland Hill under the bus. We won't be, but we will be right back. Welcome back to the National Pulse, where we don't ban people from our show because they say things in a slightly more brusque way than Fox News executives might be accustomed to. We've got Harlan Hill in the studio with us, fresh from his uh, trending on Twitter moment after, (laughs) frankly, telling it like it is. You know, I said she was smug and snippy and, and rattled and rocked and got wrecked last night by uh, Vice President Mike Pence. Holland was a little bit more to the point. 
Uh, we'll rejoin Harlan Hill here in a moment. I want to bring in Alexandra Priat, public relations expert and expert in what's going on in Pennsylvania at the moment. Alexandra, thank you for making the time for us today. Thank you, Raheem. Glad to be here. So, so, so uh, the vice president was clearly making a big pitch to people like you and your neighbors and your and your uh, uh, fellow Pennsylvanians yesterday. Uh, there was a lot about energy, a lot about fracking, a lot about uh, jobs, um, a lot on China, things that have impacted your state. Talk us through. What, what are you seeing on the ground there? Um, I think that for regular voters, probably didn't change much. I think the debate last night was definitely geared towards the important establishment Republicans in the state of Pennsylvania. I know that you talked about that this morning on the show. Um, it's whether or not, frankly, Donald Trump, they felt, had done a very poor job in the first debate, and could the vice president make up that ground. And I think he did. He didn't surprise anybody, but he really um, uh, was strong, forceful, and that's what he needed to do for the president, and for himself, frankly, as the first question Susan Page asked. Now, in terms of, in terms of uh, Pennsylvania voters, okay, um, I think that they see, um, even though he's not one of us, he seems like one of us, especially to the mid-state. The mid-state of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Lancaster, is really focused on more cultural issues, very pro-life, pro-gun, and um, very evangelical which which our, our vice president is. Um, so he really uh, connects with voters there. They've, he's made many trips to Pennsylvania um, and expect him several times more along with the president and the first family. So tell us more about the um, changes that you've seen in the state. Between We've got these maps that you, we want to put up for you between 2012 and 2016. And, and what that portends in your mind for this election? Okay, Raheem, to, to take you to this map here, I think what's most important for your viewers is to understand the state of Pennsylvania is uh, one of four things or a combination. They're either dem the state's either a Democrat state, it's a union state, which generally means Democrat, it's a pro-life state or it's a pro-gun state. We are a fiscally liberal, socially conservative state. You have local Democrats here that are still pro-life. Of course, Bob Casey's pro-life. And you have, you have many uh, pro-gun members in the, the House and legislature here, as well as active party members of the Democrat Party. So when you take a look at um, this map uh, from 2012 to 2016, you can see that the president won Erie County which is a pro-union state, but it's also a pro-life area, and it's strongly pro-gun. Same you look at Northampton County, which is right next to Lehigh County, which is near Lehigh University. It's right near Easton, the Crayola, Cray uh, Crayola Crayons plant, and it's also right near Allentown. So this is what's so important. Uh, another place that the president flipped from regular Republican candidates in the past in Luzerne County. That's up in the northeastern part of the state, and you can see that was blue for Mitt Romney in 2012. And Erie was blue for, for Mitt Romney couldn't take Erie, and he lost Chester. So the four counties switched to make Pennsylvania in play for Donald Trump. That's Erie, Luzerne, Northampton, and Chester County. All of those are generally more pro-gun, pro-life counties. So this is a remarkable turn. This is the combination that Donald Trump needs to take this year. What I think we've talked about before, and I think that's most troubling and most concerning for the, the Republican Party and for Donald Trump in particular, because sometimes he has done better than even candidates um, of the party here, is Lackawanna County, which is adjacent. You see here in 2016, although Donald Trump did not win it, he came very close to winning it by uh, just a couple hundred, a couple thousand votes he lost. This, of course, is the home of Scranton, Pennsylvania. Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, they like to claim it every single time. And the, the issue is that the president only won by about 44,000 votes. So this, this twi switching of a couple of thousand votes in Scranton, a couple of thousand votes in Luzerne County, where it's northeastern Pennsylvania, that for Biden could be, there, could be the difference of victory for the president uh, or Mr. Biden. Well, I'm really glad you walked us through that. I mean, there's so much detail to get into about these things. And often we get caught, especially myself, get caught just reading kind of the top line numbers of all the polls that are coming out. 
But the polls that are coming out are telling us that, that you know that Joe Biden is ahead on average. I'm looking at the real clear politics average here, Alexandra, at seven point one up in Pennsylvania. Uh, the last one I think that was taken was Emerson that showed five. The one before that, CNBC at four. The one before that, Quinnipiac at thirteen. How much stress do you put on numbers like that? Um, you know, I don't. Frankly, uh, I think polls are irrelevant. The only polls that matter. I would say is comparing from four years ago to today. Those are the only polls that I really track. And basically they're, they're, they're tracking the same exact numbers. So to me, they don't matter because he won Pennsylvania. I think the same, we have the same enthusiasm this year that we did last year. I think we've picked up a couple of people, new people. I think we've lost a couple of people, maybe some women, maybe the president can win them back. But I think basically everybody that voted for Donald Trump in this state is voting for him again. Here's the biggest issue that we have. We have a new voting system that's going to allow people to, with what what the uh, Supreme Court decided, which is count votes until after the election. That's a very difficult process. It's actually very orderly the way the state runs this. Um, This new system uh, could put in jeopardy a lot of, frankly, nefarious uh, options for people that want to change and um, are, are, you know, don't play by the rules, let's say. I think one indication, yeah. though, the one indication, though, well, Alexander, we've got to, Alexander, we've got to go up against the break. We're up against the break here, but that's a good tee up. Uh, stay on the line. We're going to connect with you back in the uh, for the next segment as well. Talk about these new rules, these changes in how the uh, in how the voting takes place and how long we're supposed to wait until uh, we say, OK, you know, Election Day was supposed to be November the 3rd. Ballots still being counted on, you know, November the 14th. 2026, or whatever the latest rules are. We'll be back with more information from Alexander Priat Holland Hill here in studio. I'm Raheem Kassam here downtown in Washington, D.C. We'll be back with more National Pulse right after this break. Welcome back. Uh, somebody in the live chat on YouTube said in the break that Harlan Hill looks like he's lost weight. Um, and, and Natalie said I should read that on air. I said, I don't lie to my audience. And I told you I could tweet about you, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to be the next Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. 
All right. We are uh, we're joined by Alexander Priet uh, from Pennsylvania, who's been walking us through what's going on in that critical state uh, for the president to carry. Now, Alexander, I disagree with you slightly over the debate last night. I think there was a lot of appeal to people in a state like yours and that it will have some impact on those people who are in those counties that you mentioned who may have been sitting on the fence. You don't think that? It, it was definitely a plus for the president, no question about that. Um, I think that, vo that that opinions are made pretty strongly, but if, there's no question that it had an impact. Um, I think, unfortunately, not having a, a second debate coming up, we'll see what actually takes place. But I think it did have some impact. Um, but I think the most important impact is to the players that were writing off the president by these polls. I don't believe the polls. Not because I don't believe polls. What I, what I, the polls that I believe, again, are the comparison between 2012 and now. If, he, if there's a huge jump, then I'm concerned. If they're tracking along those same lines, I think that the, the president's in good shape. I'll tell you a mile marker for me in Pennsylvania, um, a positive, is we've registered 200,000 more Republicans, new voters, than the Democrats have. Wow. So that's a plus for us. That's a big plus. A negative for us is, some people think, is Jill Stein was on the ballot last time. The Green Party is not allowed on the ballot this time. So uh, she got 49,000 votes, and the, the margin of victory was 44,000 for the president. Um, so some people think that's a factor as well. Um, the third, the third right. thing we have to, the, 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 uh, the third uh, kind of factor that people are talking about is how many absentee ballots are there? Um, about 1.6 million absentee ballots have been requested and sent for the Democrat Party. And about 590,000 have been requested for the Republican Party. So you see there's a big gap there. Um, we don't know what that means. It could mean several things. Maybe more people, more, more people definitely are um, asking for absentee ballots. In 2019, the governor said you don't have to give an excuse to get an absentee ballot. So that's a change. So normally in the past, since, in, since the 2016 election, you had to say, I'm going to be out of town. I'm sick. I have surgery. I can't make it. Now there's a no excuse for an absentee ballot. That obviously can lead to more mischievous uh, activities. Um, so I think so. I think that those are the factors that are focused on the that I think can change the the election here. But I think that the president and what the president, and the vice president did, even if the president didn't do the best job, what they explained to the American people, and I think what is resounding to people in the state of Pennsylvania, is where is America today? Where will it be if the Democrats win? That is the most important question. Because Pennsylvania is generally a conservative, socially conservative state, that doesn't mean we don't have activist, pro, pro-choice activists. We do, but I wonder if we just lost the connection to uh, Alexandra. There, we'll try and reconnect uh, in just a moment. Harlan, I'll turn to you on the points that um, Alexandra was making. I mean, Pennsylvania is critical, and it's these comes down to these four counties as Alexandra was walking us through there. Yeah, um, you. Um, I've done you a were, lot of work in Pennsylvania, you, and, and and I was going to say you watched the debate last night, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah as, obviously, as we know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I thought it had a big impact on a state like Pence. Well, there was one point that, that um, uh, Vice President Pence was really trying to hammer home and didn't really get a straight answer on that's very relevant to Pennsylvania, and it's the issue of fracking. Um, Biden has flip-flopped on fracking. He wanted to totally ban it. Now right. he's wanted to phase it out. Like, we can't get a straight answer, and, and especially in Pennsylvania T. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of jobs that will derive that are derived from the energy industry, and this will move rank-and-file voters that may have... Uh, at one point in time, been reliable Democratic voters, uh, but voted for the president in 2016 or are considering him in 20. So uh, I think the Trump campaign really, in, in just in Pennsylvania, needs to press Biden to get a clear answer on where he stands on fracking. And whatever that is, they also need to ask him why a few months ago in the Democratic primary, he explicitly said that he would ban it. He said it. Uh, in private meetings with Absolutely. people that and have been publicly. filmed. Yeah. He said it in public meetings yes. with people. He said it at town hall events. Yes. Uh, they've said time and time again, 
we will ban fracking. Yes. What impact does that have for a state like Pennsylvania? Oh, well, it's, it's huge. I mean, it's not just Pennsylvania either. It's also Ohio, right? Ohio's uh, obviously a critical battleground state, and, and there's a huge fracking industry there. Uh, okay, we have... Alexander back, but but so it's it's critical to both those states uh, because there are so many jobs in the energy industry, um, and those are reliable voters. Hmm. Do we have Alexander back with us? Was that was that what we were talking about? Oh, I think we have no Alexander back, ah. which is a really weird way ah. to tell the host that yeah. you don't have a guest. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, there, guys. All right, look. Um, We've been working on this stuff for a long time, especially regarding the specifics as it goes to right. mail-in ballots and how long these things take to count. Um, it looks like it's a total disaster mm -hmm. because there are going to be court challenges that say, hey, they got their ballot into a mailbox or into one of these drop-off locations at, uh, you know, 11.59 and 59 seconds on November the 3rd and they weren't counted and so we have to go back and count them and then we're not going to know the result for two days or three days or four days and frankly to return to a topic that we were discussing at the top of the show you know the places like Fox News they won't be making election night calls as a result the Associated Press says they're not going to be making an election night call uh, Wolf Blitzer said he won't and CNN won't be making an election there's night no call. reason they shouldn't be able to make an election night call I mean a million of people cast ballots in advance of elections every uh, cycle and uh, we're able to count those start counting those ballots we count all the votes on election day many of them by paper so it's no no different well, you yeah, run through what a scanner they're saying, what they're and, saying is there's such a differentiation but how but how many people could actually I'm saying that there really shouldn't be an issue I think that it's very telling that they're trying to make it an, like a of time course. issue so that they can That's buy the themselves time that is the tell because the same number of ballots overall should be cast. Most of them will still be paper, uh, whether they're sent in by mail or through... Uh, through uh, well, here's the thing. The, just before we go to break, they're saying they can't do it because they don't have exit poll. We won't have reliable exit poll data. Right, right. Because it'll only predominantly be Republicans going to the actual physical polls on the day. In theory, yeah. But if their polling is so good and their data of representative sampling is so good, right. then why can't they ask people via phone, online, and all this stuff, combine it with your exit poll data on the day mm -hmm. and figure out results? And, and you way. should also have... We have to oh, go right. to a break. I'll get your thoughts when we reset. I love live television because you get these moments 
like we're about to have, where, if everything works, where we get Alexandra Priat, our previous guest, in Pennsylvania, back on the line. There she is. I can see her now. Let's bring her up on. And then you also have our next guest calling in Thomas Farnan, who wrote The Russia Lie, which you can get at therussialie.com, but who's also in Pennsylvania. Tom, let's get him on as well. And now you have this magic TV moment where we have this critical state and these two geniuses in that state, in different places in that state, and we get to have this conversation. So, Alexandra, pick up where you left off with us. I just want to make one point, Raheem. I do think that the, the, the vice president was fantastic, and I do think it helped him. Um, but the, the president does have massive enthusiasm here. And, and my, my point to you here is that our, our, our two, our biggest problem for Republicans in victory is the, the mail-in ballots and the absentee ballots. We have a process that existed for decades and decades that was very smooth, understood by all voters, and allowed had a lot of opportunities for people to make their ballot known. But fixed very much so was Election Day, which is so important. We believe in a localized structure. The Democrats believe in this big government power base. And that goes for these local elections, it proves they want to take all the power and put it at the county level, okay, taking the individual precincts out of it, which allows for a lot of fraud. For instance, Delaware County, the courthouse is run 100 percent by Democrats. OK, not all of your Democrat is bad. In fact, 98 point percent of them are fabulous. But the two percent, there's a possibility for fraud. So I think the, our, our biggest I think the president, like Steve Bannon always says, the president wins on November 3rd without a question. The question is, what happens after that? Well, let's bring on a lawyer in Pennsylvania, Thomas Farnan, in addition to being a, 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 the excellent author of The Russia Lie, uh, is, a, uh, is a litigation attorney in, uh, in uh, Pennsylvania. Now, look, Thomas, I know this might not be your area of expertise, but in some re respects, we're going to need every bit of muscle we can get, legally speaking, um, after November the 3rd. I, I, have you been keeping an eye on this? What, what say you? Yes, I think the most effective thing that was done last night is, is Pence came in with very clear arguments. And so many in a place like Pittsburgh are jumping into this just now. And they've read the anti-Trump headlines. Uh, they believe he said something despicable about Charlottesville. And I think Pence answered those questions quite well. And people were listening. Um, and I thought that those questions needed to be answered. I think Trump is bombarded with all kinds of media hoaxes, and it's very difficult to unwind, you know, on your feet during a debate, um, especially in the case of Chris Wallace, when I think Chris Wallace was twisting the questioning to make it very difficult to respond. Uh, but I thought Pence was ready for that, um, and I thought he did a great job. Thomas, what is your take on the um, mail-in ballot situation? We've been speaking to Alexandra Priya about it, these, these tons of mail-in ballots now, and the ruling that, hey, you know, we may, we may just keep counting. The Democrats are going to be suing here, there, and everywhere to just keep counting until they reach the number they need. Yeah, I, I don't trust it at all. Um, I think they're taking advantage of uh, the situation with COVID. And, um, you know, I don't think it would be very difficult to discover... 40,000 ball ballots in a you know, locker at the Philadelphia airport and show up with them on November 15th. Um, so I, I do expect shenanigans. Um, what Trump needs to do is win by a sufficient margin that that doesn't come into play. And I think that's possible. I, I don't think you can trust the polling because I think people are clamming up. Uh, there is such sort of outrage projected at Trump on pla at places like social media um, that people just don't want to deal with that. So they're not telling anyone uh, if they are for Trump. And that includes pollsters. They're, they're going to keep it between themselves and what they do at the ballot box. And I noticed that in 2016. When I walked into my polling place, uh, everyone was holding their cards tight to their vest. Uh, and I had predicted before that election that Trump would win and he would win the Rust Belt. And I predicted that at, at the uh, New York Observer. And, you know, that was sort of confirmation when I walked in there. Like, it's, it's the old uh, song, something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Um, and I'm, I'm getting that same sense now. I, I don't know that you can trust polling. 
Um, I do think uh, President Trump uh, has to do a great job answering the media hoaxes. And I thought that uh, Vice President Pence did do that last night. All right, yeah, Alexander, we're, we're up against it for time here. So I just want to I want to uh, thank you for coming on here. The anti Kamala Harris, by the way, uh, if Holland Hill calls uh, Kamala Harris uh, insufferable and a liar, then Alexander Priya is both sufferable and a truth teller. Alexander, <laughs> thank, thank you so much for, for suffering through Great us today. Tom, I want to pivot away uh, to a different topic, uh, the one we originally wanted to have you on here about, which is the Russia lie. Tom, you first brought me this ebook uh, that you've published at therussialie.com. Um, I'm I just getting some, so much great feedback from the people that have uh, bought it and read it. It's just five bucks, but there's almost everything you need to know about this hoax in there, right? You talked about the importance of addressing these hoaxes. Um, but you brought me this, and, and, and it kind of took me a while to, to kind of make the time and go through it and dot the I's and cross the T's. And, and you're a, a, a rigorous man of updates, uh, to be polite about it. <laughs> and we finally got it out. But since it has come out, it's almost over and over and over again, day by day, that you'll be being proved more and more correct. Uh, it, the Russia lie was the Russia lie. What's the latest? Yeah, everyone else says, you know, we, we need to see the breadcrumbs that are, that are going to drop because of the president's declassification. And I'll say that everything the president has declassified in the last couple of weeks that have come to light confirm the thesis that I present in the book. And it's not something that you can understand by a tweet. It's not something that you can understand by an 800-word essay, although you're getting a little closer there. Uh, we've condensed it into a 40-page book, and uh, we've presented it, I think, very clearly and in a very entertaining way. But I think we have to understand what happened here. You know, I make reference to the military-industrial complex in the title, and that's not a slam on the military. I'm very pro-military. But what we have to know is that a bunch of mediocre bureaucrats took control of some tools that we had developed for the Cold War, right. and they used them Tom, against we've the we've got American a break here. Tom, we've got a sure. break here, but, but, but hold that thought. We'll come back to you in just a moment. And I also want to ask you about Cambridge Analytica and the latest to do with that. We'll see you in a second. Greatest fights 
right now that's kind of bubbling under the surface is the internecine warfare on the political right. There's a reason I opened this show by talking about Harlan Hill and his tweet, which you may not have thought was the most advisable thing, but it's certainly not a reason to ban somebody from your network, which is exactly what Fox News did. And the number of people who go on that network and repeat the Russia lie, the number of people on the right in general who repeat and buy in to the Russia lie, the idea that Vladimir Putin and, and the Kremlin and the, the Russian uh, bots somehow interfered to, to, to any extent in the last election is something that has come completely and utterly unraveled. But I also see it. We see people tweeting, oh, wouldn't it be great to have Nikki Haley as the next president? No, no, it wouldn't. That is what was rejected. The neoconservative, neoliberal establishment wing of the Republican Party was what was rejected by people in 2016. That would be a disaster. And it's just over and over again, you're starting to see the build-up of this big battle between these factions. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell throwing the President and the White House under the bus earlier today, saying he hasn't been over there because, frankly, they didn't uh, adhere to his standards on dealing with the pandemic since August. You see them already, can't you? Lining up, jumping off the ship, hoping this president loses, because it's what they've wanted all along. Well, we'll talk about that a whole lot more on this show, on the nationalpulse.com and on this network as the weeks and months go on. It'll be a bloody fight. Now, what's that old uh, Godfather quote? These things have to happen every five, ten years. Helps to get rid of the bad blood. Been ten years since the last one. Well, we're going to have another one in our future. Thomas Fawn is joining us back after the break to discuss the Russia lie. Thomas, there were so many people back in 2016 and 17, especially my proximity to Steve Bannon, uh, running Breitbart London back then, uh, helping out with the Brexit campaign, working with Nigel Farage. You know, for a lot of people, they thought I was the linchpin. Maybe I was the Kremlin guy at the centerpiece of all of this. And one of those things that they kept throwing at me, even though I had absolutely no knowledge or nothing to do with the organization, was Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica, Cambridge Analytica. I think I met the guy from Cambridge Analytica once at a Christmas party. It was about my, the extent of my dealings with Cambridge Analytica. Uh, but I believe it's the Spectator magazine, which has been one of these sort of flip back and forth conservative and neoliberal magazines over the years uh, that published an, an article by Brendan O'Neill, a, a famed libertarian in the United Kingdom, today talking about the destruction of the Cambridge Analytica narrative as well. Tell us more. Yeah, I think that the premise uh, that, you know, call them what you want, the globalists have is that people like me in Pittsburgh don't make up our own minds, that somehow smarter people are manipulating us on the Internet. And that's condescending and it's offensive. And it's a reason that I never believed any of this Russian interference. I knew that my vote in 2016 was not influenced at all uh, by Vladimir Putin. But the... Uh, powerful people, the bureaucracies, keep trying to prove this. And one of the places they tried to prove it was over the Brexit vote. Uh, they were trying to say that that vote was influenced by internet manipulations uh, that nobody could possibly describe, and that Putin was somehow behind it. And you Brits have something called the Information Commissioner. So I give you credit for naming your mediocre bureaucrats in a mediocre way, because that's quite a name. <laughs> but the information, the Information Commissioner determined uh, either today or yesterday that there's nothing to this. Um, and if you had an ounce of common sense, you always knew that there was nothing to it. People make up their own minds. Uh, people uh, that work, uh, as I do in Pittsburgh, that have to make causal connections where you work, that cannot engage in fantasies uh, like the United States Senate does over um, uh, things like Russian interference, uh, we think pretty clearly and we think for ourselves. And I, and I think uh, the Brits chose Brexit, and we chose Trump, and they're very similar, very similar movements. 
Thomas, where do we go from here? We've got about two minutes left to go. Tell us where the, the Russia lie takes us next. You know, we keep getting told uh, by a lot of people who are very, very trusting on the Internet. You know, we hold tick tock, tick tock. You know, time's nearly up for these people. Durham's about to bust in. People are going to jail. Gitmo's being prepared. But really, realistically, I mean, I mean, feet on the ground, realistically, where where do we stand on, on people being held to account for this? It's in the hands of the Justice Department. It's in the hands of U.S. Attorney John Durham. Um, he hasn't moved quickly. Uh, I knew a year ago uh, who the bad actors were, and I could have identified them based on open source Internet research. Um, I think it's very important that people don't get you know, bamboozled, that you know the facts, that you ascertain the facts. Uh, I think you're right about you know, the, the warfare on the right. Uh, you have to go to the right sources. And I would encourage everyone to read the excerpt that we're gonna publish this weekend at the National Pulse and to read my book because it gets much, much deeper into these things. Uh, there was never any reason to believe this. Uh, it's always been a fabrication. President Trump is known. When he stood on at the podium with Putin in Helsinki in 2018, he said Russia didn't inter interfere in the election and everyone got upset with him, um, including members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Republican dominated Senate Intelligence Committee. But everything that's coming out proves that point, and it's very important to know that um, because the plotters, uh, you know, they've, they've robbed the bank here and we've given them the getaway car. If Russia interfered, then guys like John Brennan are going to say, we were just investigating Russian interference. You can't get us for that. We were, you know, saving America from the red menace. And he already started that this week. Uh, when right. they found notes right. of him briefing President Obama about Hillary Clinton's false flag act operation and they confronted him with it, he said, why wouldn't Hillary Clinton go after Trump on Putin? Because that's really what was happening. And we right. have Republicans right. that have supported that point of view, and there's no evidence of it. None, none, none. Thomas, we've got to leave it there. We're up against the break here, but it's great having you on. We'll keep having you on every single week on this program. Uh, really grateful for all of your work. And maybe we should even get you down to D.C. at some point, do a special on the Russia lie here in studio. I'd really enjoy that. Uh, we'll talk about it off, uh, offline. Uh, we'll be back with Natalie Winters after this break.
Where does the time go? I've got to remember the show ends at four o'clock. I'll remember that today. All right. Uh, in studio with me now is Natalie Winters. Breaking news. Um, I've got some breaking news for you, actually. The uh, the similar web statistics are out today, and it shows uh, just a massive growth for the National Pulse website. So I want to thank all of you guys out there. We're actually bigger uh, than The Spectator in the U.S., or bigger than, the, well, approaching the same size as the American conservative website. And we've been around for, oh, all of nine and a bit months. So I'm very grateful for everybody that has supported us and helped our astronomical growth on the site, especially you, Natalie Winters, with all the scoops. Uh, what have we got up today? Well, time and time again, we've been told to trust the experts when it comes to the pandemic. And time and time again, it seems that these so-called experts are deeply in bed with the Chinese Communist Party. So today we have an exclusive report up on the New England Journal of Medicine. If you're not aware, that is probably the, the top scientific medical journal that is uh, based in the United States, really one of the so-called experts. But they've actually partnered with effectively the Chinese Communist Party, specifically in the form of the Shanghai Science and Technology Publishing House. So, take a step back, <laughs> take a breath. Yes. You've got plenty of time. <laughs> the New England Journal of Medicine comes out with an op ed that says, Get Trump out of office. The media goes wild and says, Oh, look at this extraordinary thing, these extraordinary times we live in, when a, a medical journal, which has never endorsed a political candidate before, has to come out with an editorial called Dying in a Leadership Vacuum, trying to convince people to vote Trump out of office because of the Chinese Communist Party's virus. But behind the scenes, what you're telling us is that the media isn't telling us, while they're reporting what the journal is saying, they're not reporting their links to the Chinese Communist Party. No, it's extremely hypocritical that they're attacking President Trump's response to the virus, given that the only reason that President Trump could have allegedly botched handling of the virus would have been because of the Chinese Communist Party and the way that they coerced the World Health Organization, which honestly in some ways seems comparable perhaps to the New England Journal of Medicine. And remember, this is all coming on the heels of a U.S. intelligence report saying that the Chinese Communist Party does indeed prefer a Joe Biden presidency. That doesn't come as a surprise to anyone who's been following the news. But this publishing company that the New England Journal of Medicine partnered with, they actually launched a Chinese publication in 2016, uh, is, is effectively the Chinese Communist Party through and through. They have meetings with staff members where they take oaths to the Chinese Communist Party. They go on field trips to Chinese Communist Party buildings. They say in, on their website, they boast about how they've won awards from the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda department, right. uh, and, and both in their personal lives and even really the purpose of this publishing company saying that they won't put out any work that doesn't align with the the narrative of the Chinese Communist Party so it's very interesting when you see this long scathing op-ed abandoning I believe it's their over 200 year track record of never really getting involved with politics yet the one time they do it dovetails not only with partnering with the Chinese government but when you know the Chinese government desperately wants President Trump out of office I encourage everyone to go and look at the article there's some very good pictures of all these people who are, you know, effectively business partners of the New England Journal of Medicine posing alongside the, the flag of the Chinese Communist Party, raising their fist while taking the oath. It's, it's really an egregious story. No, it, it, is, it is extraordinary because, it, it, you know, put it this way, it didn't even, not, that, not to undermine any of your work, Natalie, but it didn't even take you very long to figure all this out. I mean, we talked about it this morning over text message, uh, look into this, uh, and, and within a couple of hours, we knew everything about this link. Um, with the Chinese Communist Party from the New England uh, Journal of Medicine, which just raises the question in my mind time and time again. Does the media know and not care, or are these reporters too lazy to check? I think it, it is a mix of both. Obviously, we've highlighted how outlets like the New York Times and CNN have close relationships to some extent with the Chinese Communist Party. But sometimes I think the media just takes these stories. For example, the New England Journal of Medicine, because it is so prestigious, comes out endorsing President Trump. They're not going to double check, triple check. They just want to run with a certain narrative, whether it's, you know, you see these formal, former generals going on to endorse Biden or former Republicans who endorse Biden over Trump. Well, it turns 
out there are also lobbyists for the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, these so-called nonpartisan actors have funneled thousands of dollars to Democratic campaigns. So I think it's kind of the broader strategy of the media to, to play this nonpartisan, to purposely ignore telling the whole truth because it makes their case come off stronger. Well, one of the stories that's big on the National Pulse today is entitled Unrestricted Bioweapon. This is on the back of uh, defector Dr. Li Meng Yan releasing her new report, her second report, into the Chinese Communist Party's virus, claiming that it is a laboratory product but is also an unrestricted bioweapon. So this is kind of even more to the point of the fact that we are at war with the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese Communist Party is at war with the Western world and we haven't started taking it seriously yet. Um, you can read the whole report um, on the nationalpulse.com, uh, but I just want to run through a couple of the key points for you here. I mean, there's a lot of science in this report, a lot of science that I don't necessarily understand, which is why we've just embedded the report for you to look at. But what she says, and, 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 and her co-authors with her effectively say, in, in Dr. Yang's new report is, quote, the scientific evidence and records indicate that the current pandemic is not a result of accidental release of a gain of function product, but a planned attack using an unrestricted bioweapon. The current pandemic, therefore, should be correspondingly considered as a result of unrestricted bio warfare. It's an incredibly hard pill to swallow, especially considering what the reactions and responses have been here on Capitol Hill, in Washington, D.C., uh, in London, in Brussels, in Rome, you know, across the Western world, uh, either finding reason to, to blame ourselves because we're not wearing masks in the right times or not distancing properly, getting, you know, silly plexiglass things, uh, you know, in our d debates, putting off a debate now. Joe Biden uh, wants to do a virtual debate because he's scared, he's afraid of catching this virus, the Chinese Communist Party's virus, the lockdowns, everything, the prolonged, uh, Bill de Blasio persecuting Jewish people in New York because they fail to socially distance in a way that he deems appropriate, while he has no interest in telling Black Lives Matter protesters to do the same. And yet we cannot get our heads around the fact that this may well be a weapon of bio-warfare. The story is up on the nationalpulse.com. Remember, we'll be reading off a list of our new members tomorrow. Go to the nationalpulse.com forward slash support or fundrealnews.com. Until then, we'll see you again tomorrow at 3 p.m.